Hi everyone, my name is Jonathan Laurent and I'm a PhD student at Carnegie Mellon University. Today, I'm delighted to talk to you about AlphaZero, an algorithm that made history when it achieved superhuman level at the game of Go. As I hope to convey, the ideas behind this algorithm are surprisingly simple and far-reaching. My belief is that Julia can play a major role in making AlphaZero accessible to a wider range of people and therefore foster exciting applications beyond the realm of board games. But first, let me take you back a few years ago to this moment where DeepMind's AlphaGo algorithm defeated Go's world champion Lee Saddle. It was a bittersweet moment for Go players all around the world. And also a complete surprise to many AI experts who believed at the time that such an achievement was at least 10 years away. The AlphaGo algorithm was based mix of supervised learning and reinforcement learning. Supervised learning means that an agent was trained to mimic humans in a large sample of games. In a second step, this agent improved to a superhuman level by playing a series of games against itself. We call reinforcement learning this paradigm of having an agent learn through trial and error by interacting directly with its environment and getting rewarded for different outcomes. One year after AlphaGo beat Lee Settle, DeepMind announced AlphaGo Zero. As opposed to AlphaGo, AlphaGo Zero was fully based on reinforcement learning, and it learned through pure self-play without human knowledge. AlphaGo Zero beat its predecessor 100 games to zero after 72 hours of training. The underlying algorithm, coined AlphaZero, was later used to reach unprecedented level at various board games, including chess and shogi. This is the algorithm we will be discussing in this talk. This talk will be organized in four parts. First, I will give you a short lecture on the AlphaZero algorithm, and then I'll discuss some of the exciting research challenges of using it to solve problems beyond board games. After this, I will introduce my AlphaZero.jl package, whose primary goal is to make AlphaZero accessible to a wide range of students and researchers. I'll show you how Julia enables a combination of speed, flexibility, and simplicity that I believe is simply out of reach in any other existing language. Finally, I'll close with a few words on how I believe there's a huge opportunity to make Julia a game-changing environment for reinforcement learning research. So let's start with explaining what AlphaZero is all about. At a high level, AlphaZero augments a tree search procedure with two learned heuristics. These heuristics are improved iteratively during training and, as you may have guessed, they are implemented by a neural network. This neural network takes as an input a game state and it outputs two things. First, it outputs a single number in the minus one one range. This number is a prediction about the final outcome of the game for the current player. Indeed, at the end of the game, both players receive a reward of either one for a win, zero for a draw, or minus one for a loss. The expected value of this reward in a given state is called the value of this state, and this is what the network is trying to estimate here. On this tic-tac-toe example, the predicted value for the cross player is slightly negative, hinting at a slightly defavorable position that could still possibly lead to a draw. The second output of the neural network is called the policy prior, and it is a probability distribution over all available actions. In this example, the network is estimating that the strongest move is at the bottom center, but that two other moves may be worth considering too. Note that once the, player is, once the network is trained, the policy prior alone often yields a pretty strong player. Concretely, if you play a game against the neural network of AlphaGo Zero, if the network always plays the action with highest policy prior, you're almost certainly going to lose. However, we can make the network much stronger by plugging it into a tree search algorithm. 
Many of you are probably familiar with using TreeSearch to solve simple games using the MinMax algorithm. AlphaZero uses a variant called Monte Carlo TreeSearch, or MCTS, that is very good at leveraging the uncertainty estimates provided by the network heuristics. More concretely, suppose you're looking at a game state and you are wondering what your next action should be. To investigate, you are going to grow a game tree that stores statistics about how many times each node was visited and how favorable it is looking so far. MCD starts with a one node tree and then performs a series of simulations that each grows the tree a little bit. During each simulation, one selects a node at the frontier of the tree, one expands this node by adding its children to the tree, one estimates the value of the selected node by querying the neural network, and finally, one updates the statistics of all ancestor nodes accordingly before the next simulation can start. So this probably all sounds very abstract to you, so let me illustrate this algorithm step by step on a concrete example. Let's say you want to estimate a good first move for tic-tac-toe. You start with a tree with a single node for the initial state, whose visits and rewards counters are initialized to zero. Intuitively, the number of rewards collected by a node divided by its number of visits gives you an ongoing estimate of its value for the associated player. So let's run a first MCDS simulation. The first step is to select a node at the frontier of the tree, and here we really have no choice. Then we expand the selected node by adding its children to the tree. I only added three children here for simplicity, but in reality there should be nine. The next step is to make a call to the neural network in order to get a value estimate for the selected state. Here, the network could say 0.4, for example. At the same time, the network also computes a policy prior on available actions. And we use this prior to annotate the action edges. The final step is the update step. And in this case, because the selected node has no ancestor, we just increment its visit count and add its estimate value to the rewards counter. Then we can start a second MCTS simulation. For the second simulation, we start by selecting the root of the tree and then we navigate the tree until we reach a final state or a frontier node. To navigate the tree, we proceed as follows. Every time we want to decide on a child to visit, we compute a score for every child and visit the one with the highest score. The score of each child is given by a formula called the UCT formula, which balances two important goals known in reinforcement learning as exploration and exploitation. This first term here is simply an estimate of the value of a given child. Choosing children with the highest estimated value is important because we want to explore the parts of the game tree that appear as most promising. At the same time, we also want to explore children that haven't yet received many visits and may ultimately look better after they receive some more attention. This is achieved by the second term in the UCT formula, which favors nodes that haven't received many visits and yet are attributed a good prior probability of being relevant by the neural network. In this case, we can compute the UCT scores of all children, and because none of them has been visited yet, their value estimate default to zero in the node associated with highest policy prior wins. Now we've reached a node at the frontier of the tree. If this node were a final state, we would simply update the tree using a concrete terminal reward of minus one, zero, one. But because this node is not final, we expand it, and then simply ask the network for a value estimate and a policy prior. Once the network answers, we use its value estimate, here it is minus 0.6, to update the tree statistics. We start by updating the selected node itself, and then we move to update its parent. To update the parent, we just increment the visit counter and subtract minus 0.6 with the rewards counter. The reason we do a subtraction and not an addition is because the value estimate for the network was expressed from the perspective of the opposite player. 
Okay, so we've already done two complete MCDS simulations. I leave it as an exercise to the listener to perform, let's say, 598 more before MCDS can return. After 600 simulations in total, MCDS returns a probability distribution of our actions. Each action is given a weight proportional to the visit counter of the associated child. Now, you may ask, why return a probability distribution rather than one best action? And the answer is twofold. First, we want to allow a large diversity of games being played during training, as a fully deterministic agent playing against itself would always play the same game, which is boring. The second reason has to do with the key insight underlying how AlphaZero's network is trained, which is to consider MCDS as a policy improvement operator. To understand this insight, let's remember that a policy is a function that maps a state to a probability distribution of reactions. But then, what is MCDS? MCDS takes as a parameter a neural network that implements a policy. Then, it acts as a new policy that takes a state as an input and returns a distribution of reactions. Therefore, MCDS should really be seen as a policy improvement operator that takes a policy as an input and returns a stronger one. Alpha Zero is all about starting with a weak policy, a random one even, and repeatedly apply the MCDS operator to it until it gets good enough. Now, of course, you're going to ask, how do you iterate the MCDS operator? Having an agent make nested calls to MCDS certainly does not sound scalable. And the answer here is to use gradient descent. More precisely, to apply the MCDS operator to the network, one can proceed as follows. First, one plays a series of games using MCDS with the current network. And then, one updates the weights of the network using gradient descent so that the network's policy matches the MCDS policy in all encounter states. At the same time, one also updates the network so that its value predictions match the observed game outcomes. And this is how AlphaZero is trained. By starting with a randomly initialized network and then repeatedly applying these steps until you get a superhuman Go player or until you exceed your electricity budget. Note that there is nothing specific about Go in the algorithm I just described. In fact, Alpha Zero can be easily generalized to work on any zero-sum game or any Markov decision process with discrete actions, as long as it can be simulated efficiently. This raises the question of potential applications of Alpha zero like algorithms beyond the realm of board games. And indeed, one can imagine such applications in areas including chip design, chemical synthesis, or auto automated theorem improving, for example. Using Alpha Zero in these areas raises some very exciting research challenges. To give you a taste of these, let me take the case of symbolic mathematics and automated theorem improving, which are the topics of my own research. If you think about it, computing an indefinite integral or proving, a mathematical, or proving a mathematical theorem comes down to applying the right sequence of reasoning principles in the right order. This is a formal game in which it's tempting and natural to try and train an alpha zero-like agent. Doing so opens a lot of fascinating research and engineering questions. And I can share some of them with you by enumerating a list of reasons for why I believe AlphaGo was so successful and what may be needed to generalize the success to automated theorem improving. First of all, in the case of Go, simulating the environment is very cheap. In fact, it is practically free compared to the cost of evaluating the neural network. In the case of automated theorem improving, performing a single regime step is potentially more expensive. Things aren't so bad if all you need is to apply a single writing rule, 
But what if you need to compute a Grobner basis or call a SAT solver? In any case, this creates a strong need for faster libraries for symbolic reasoning. And for this reason, I'm following what's happening with symbolics.jl pretty closely. Then, in the case of Go, the action space has a very simple structure. In any state, there's only a finite number of actions, and all of them are associated to a board position. In contrast, if you think about automated theorem proving, applying a theorem requires instantiating its arguments, and there is potentially an infinite number of ways to do so. In my opinion, a key to success here is to design interactive theorem provers whose interface is RL friendly and only involves finite branching. Another reason AlphaZero works so great for Go is that the convolutional neural networks that have been developed for solving vision problems are surprisingly adapted to analyzing the structure of a Go board. In the case of automated theorem proving, people are still looking for architectures that are well adapted to the semantic structure of mathematical formulas. Natural candidates are graph neural networks and transformer networks, but there's still a lot of research going on here. Finally, a great priority of many board games that we don't have in many other applications is that board games such as Go, Chess, Tic-Tac-Toe, or Connect4 are symmetric. What I mean by this is that the rules are the same for both players. As a consequence, an agent always has an opponent playing at its level that they can learn from, namely itself. In contrast, if you look at automated theorem proving, there is one player trying to prove theorems, and if the theorems are too hard, the agents is just going to fail repeatedly and never get a useful training signal. This creates a need for a form of curriculum learning where another agent is repeatedly trained to generate tasks at the right level of difficulty. So as you can see, these are very exciting research questions, and many more arise when you look at different applications areas. However, there are really few people currently trying to build an alpha zero, which is surprising given that the fame and success that this algorithm has earned. I believe that the big reason for this has been the lack of open source implementations that are simple and flexible while still being fast enough to allow meaningful experiments on limited compute power. And this is where Julia and AlphaZero.jl come into play. Indeed, when I first got into AlphaZero, I found two different kinds of implementations. On the one hand, you had very successful projects such as LilaChess Zero, but they were written in low-level languages and specialized to particular games. On the other hand, I found many Python implementations in GitHub, but they were much too slow for me to run meaningful experiments. Indeed, in contrast to many ML applications where most computation happens within matrix multiplication routine, AlphaZero does a lot of tree search, and this becomes a bottleneck for the Python interpreter. AlphaZero.jl achieved a sweet spot as it is one to two orders of magnitude faster than pure Python implementations without sacrificing anything in terms of flexibility and simplicity. To be fair, it is still four times slower than some C++ implementations, but I believe a big part of this gap may close pretty soon as Julia improves, but more on this later. The primary reason AlphaZero.jl can meet the sweet spot is honestly pretty boring. As much as I wish I could tell you I did something very smart, a lot of it comes down to Julia's inherent speed and its just-in-time compiler doing wonders. A slightly less obvious killer feature of Julia, though, is its native support for composable parallel programming. As mentioned in Julia's manual, Julia supports four categories of concurrent and parallel programming, which are asynchronous tasks, multi-threading, distributed computing, and GPU computing. AlphaZero.jl leverages all four. To illustrate this, let's look at how we generate self-play data. First of all, data generation is split across all available machines using distributed.jl. 
Each machine simulates some games and sends back training sample to the main process memory buffer. Each machine is itself spawning several simulation workers. And this is very important, even in a machine with a single CPU core. Indeed, in order to leverage GPU parallelism, one must not evaluate board positions one by one and only call the network on big batches. Consequently, we have each machine spawn a single inference server, which receives inference queries from all workers and only calls the network when it has a full batch to process. And Julia really shines here. Not only does it offer full native support for concurrent and parallel programming, but its task handling primitives are composable and thus do not get in the way of modularity. Indeed, in Alpha 0.jl, 95% of the code is completely agnostic to batching and parallelism. In particular, the MCDS implementation is written in a straightforward sequential fashion. Concretely, this is how you create a single sequential MCDS worker. And this is how you spawn multiple workers communicating with a shared inference server. The only difference is that we're passing a special kind of oracle to the MCDS workers, which internally uses a channel to communicate with the server asynchronously. But the magic is that the MCDS module does not have to know about any of this. Now, despite all the nice things I just said, Alpha0.jl is still leaving performance on the table. This manifests clearly on my Connect4 benchmark, where the GPU utilization can be as low as 50%, while not even two CPU cores are fully utilized. Here, one culprit is the garbage collector. Indeed, Julia's GC sometimes does not play very well with code that allocates GPU tensors heavily. This is one of the rare places where I'm actually envying Python's ref counting. Alpha 0 jl also spans a large number of tasks, which may add some more overhead and contribute to the GC pressure. I find these issues difficult to diagnose and quantify with the current tools, so. Now, to be fair, the situation is massively better than it used to be. Indeed, I remember a time where Alpha 0 jl was spending 90% of its time in GC. Also, I'm optimistic that we'll eventually get a 2 or 3x speed up for almost free, as Julia continues to improve. Things I have in mind include compiler transformations that insert calls when they free, support for half precision flows in the JL, and better tooling to identify opportunities for targeted optimizations. If you want to learn more about Alpha 0 JL, I encourage you to visit its document page. Among other things, you will find a detailed tutorial on how to train a near-perfect Connect4 agent. This should only take a few hours if your computer has a GPU. The tutorial also features more detailed benchmarks in the discussion about hyperparameters. Note that we did not spend much time training them, so I'm sure you can make the agent learn much faster if you try. You'll also find step-by-step -step instructions for using Alpha 0 JL on your own games and MDPs. Okay, so I want to conclude this talk on a more general note. Reinforcement learning as a field is full of exciting research challenges and untapped applications. However, I suspect that Python's predominance in the machine learning community is dramatically restricting the range of questions and problems that are being explored. As we've seen, Julia offers two killer features for RL research. By solving the two-language problem and providing native support for parallel and distributed computing. I believe that Julia could offer much more though. Thanks to multiple dispatch, Julia has been fostering a software ecosystem with an unprecedented level of modularity and composability. In contrast, the status quo in RL research is a mess of perishable forks and people running whole pipelines from scratch, causing a lot of pain and wasted efforts. My question for the Julia community then is, can we change this? And how can I help? Thank you.